Hey guys, welcome back. Joe Brunsman, Insurance Broker to the Stars. Tonight, a highly contentious and very misunderstood topic, and that is how much tech e and insurance does my MSP need? Now, I'm putting this out now because I know a lot of you guys are coming up for renewal soon, and the MSP community has been awesome to me, so I thought I would give back and tell you, hey, this is what I'm talking to my own clients about when it comes to how much insurance they should carry on their tech e and policy. Now, I wish it was as simple as what I have in front of you. This is from my first book back in 2015, 2016, something like that. <clears throat> and I just went out to a bunch of insurers and I said, hey, uh, give me a rundown based on firm revenue, how much insurance these firms are carrying. Unfortunately, that just doesn't exist. So while I wish I could say, hey, if you're a million dollar MSP, you need to carry this amount of insurance. And if you're 2 million or 5 million or 10 million, you need to carry this much insurance. That just doesn't exist. Uh, check back in with me like 15 years from now and hopefully I can provide something like this to you. <clears throat> now, what's the problem with MSP insurance? Um, maybe you're yelling at your screen right now and you're saying the cost, Joe, the cost of insurance. Okay, well, that's part of it. But as I said before, we just don't have a lot of data sets, uh, none that I know of that are statistically viable that I could point you to to say, hey, carry this much insurance. Now, for a bunch of very nerdy insurance reasons that I will spare you from, <clears throat> you should have a tech e &O policy, which is effectively an e &O policy and a cyber policy combined into one policy. So you got to think about those two kind of broad variables right there. Next, there's a total lack of clarity in terms of coverages and features within tech e &O policies. And so with that, I would argue, uh, one, that is my industry's fault uh, for having a bunch of novices trying to sell this stuff to you that have no tech background, uh, that probably aren't going to be around in two years to begin with. And so they're just selling what they can to keep the lights on. All right. So a lot of lack of clarity there. Next. Obviously, the liability for MSPs is evolving very quickly. Um, you guys are already seeing that probably with your own peers, hopefully not within your own business. But that, of course, is leading to the perennial favorite of insurance people, which is scare tactics uh, to get you into buying higher limit policies. Now, more insurance is not necessarily better insurance. So we're going to go through a lot of the intangibles uh, that I talk to my own MSP clients about so that hopefully you can get a better handle along with your business partners on how much insurance you actually want to carry here. Now, <clears throat> basic rundown of tech E&O. We could make this infinitely complex, but at the end of the day, fundamentally, you got two sides of insurance here. You have your E&O coverage and you have your cyber coverage. So E&O, you can think of that as malpractice insurance. So that's clients, vendors, regulators. Somebody wants money from your business, okay? The other side is gonna be cyber coverage. That's for you, and that's money that your business has to pay, needs to pay, wants to pay following some type of cyber event. Once again, that's internal. That's not cyber insurance for your clients. Now, let me give you an example of how the two sides could actually play together here. So let's imagine a supply chain attack. You get hit with ransomware. That goes through your RMM, hits all of your clients with ransomware. How does this play out? Well, at least initially, uh, the cyber coverages are going to come into play. And <clears throat> that's going to be, you know, attorney, forensics, business interruption, reimbursement, all that type of stuff under an appropriate policy. And then the legal wheels move a lot slower than the cyber wheels. And so then if or when you face an E&O claim for that, that's when the E&O coverages will come into play. Now, <clears throat> defense within the limit policies. Why is, this, why is this important that you know this? Well, let me take a step back. The video that you see in the bottom of the screen there, that's called Get Smart, Defense in Depth for Your MSP. Ideally, before you ever go to court, you already have defenses in place to make your experience much, much, uh, hopefully shorter and gentler uh, than the average claim. All right, so that's like a 40 minute video. It is horrifically boring and dry, but it's very, very crucial. I put that out a couple of years ago. 
still very valid today. So please make sure you watch that at some point. Now, defense within the limit policies. What does that mean? Uh, first of all, nearly all tech you know, policies have this with, depending upon when you watch this, uh, the state of Arizona, unless they've been smart enough to repeal that. But for like 99% of you, defense within the limits. So what does that mean? Defense costs erode the overall limit of liability. Now, how about a human example to illustrate the point? Let's imagine you have a million dollars worth of insurance. All right. Now, defense costs start coming into play. So that's attorney, forensics, expert witness testimony. Of that million dollars, let's imagine you spend 250000 on all of those defense costs. Well, now you only have $750,000 left to pay the plaintiff a judgment. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. We'll talk about why that is. But you always want to encourage a settlement and just try to get out of the legal system wherever possible. Now, let's talk about settling within limits and bad faith claims. Uh, sorry for the water. <clears throat> I've quite the, uh, the dry throat tonight. So, settling within the limits and bad faith claims. First, you should know that generally a plaintiff can just figure out how much insurance you have. They can just subpoena that. So, they'll know how much you're playing with. So, if you have just some outrageous amount of insurance for your circumstance that may not be the best place to be. Next, you should know that almost every state um, has at least a common law rule that you as a policyholder can have a bad faith claim so you could go back and sue your own insurance company if the insurance company did not offer a reasonable settlement within your policy limits. Now, I have had Clients in the past, they face a claim and they're like, by God, I'm going to show these guys and I'll prove to them that it wasn't me and that they're the bad guy and I'm not the bad guy. I get it. It's an emotional response. Your business is your baby. We probably spend more time, uh, time in the day with our business than we do our families. But you don't want to go to court. All right. If you go to court, I would argue you've already lost at least something and only the attorneys win every court case, all right? They're generally always getting paid. So it actually makes sense that an insurance company will try to settle, all right? The few times that I've had the clients go, by God, I'm going to show them we're going to court. Within a few months, they're like, Jesus, Joe, the, all the documentation I have to provide and the time I got to take away from my business to work with my attorney and we got to work on strategy and you know, now I got to get ready to get on the stand and I'm super nervous about that. Well, <clears throat> you don't want to be there. All right. You don't want to be there. So it actually typically works in both of your favors, you and the insurance company that they're going to try and offer a settlement. Now, bad faith laws, it's a just a giant jumble mess of insanity. So I'm not even going to pretend to go through all the various elements of a bad faith claim. It varies by state by state. So please talk to your attorney. Now let's talk about some of those uh, intangibles. <clears throat> Things that I go over with my clients that I just wouldn't know because I don't have that deep insight into your business like you do. These are things that you should talk to your business partners about to make sure you're all singing off the same sheet of music. So one, what are you legally and or contractually obligated to carry. If you just have a hard requirement for, let's say, two, three, four, five million of insurance, well, you just have to get that amount to adhere to the contract. Next, who are your clients? What do they do? What is your relationship with those clients? All right, so a lot of it's going to depend on jurisdiction and who you're working with, right? So let's imagine you're in a super cutthroat city environment um, you know, your clients, they're not your golfing buddies. You didn't grow up with them. And let's say they're running big high dollar businesses. Well, then maybe you should consider more insurance to deal with that type of issue. Now let's imagine you're in the middle of Montana. All right. Maybe your clients are not these big giant, uh, corporate behemoths. They're your buddies that you grew up with. 
and litigation's a lot more rare in Montana than it's going to be in New York City. And maybe the judge belongs to your country club, right? These are all intangibles that can play into this. All right. If you're like, hey, now don't fall within the trap of all my clients are friends, right? Like we all met at Temple or we all met at church. You don't want to fall into that because I've seen that go sideways before when big dollars are on the table, but that's going to play into it, right? If you're just working with big corporate behemoths where a dollar lost is a dollar lost and they're going to get it back, you got to think about that as far as insurance limits go. If they're all your buddies, they're small to medium sized businesses, you're in a, you know, kind of a, a country environment or more of a suburban environment, uh, well then you should take that into account and you might need less insurance. Next, what's the worst case scenario? I love going through this exercise with people because I think it adds a lot of clarity when it comes to insurance. Now, we have to keep it reasonable when we're talking about a worst case scenario. So yeah, what if a what if an asteroid hits the East Coast and wipes out an entire data center? Well, I don't know what the odds of that are. Hopefully, somebody's keeping track of that, but it seems like the odds are pretty low. And yeah, that would be the absolute worst case scenario, but a circumstance like that, I don't even know what would happen. And assuming you're liable for it, there's probably not enough insurance in the world that you could buy, um, much less the cost of it, to make up for the prospective income loss of every single one of your clients from now until eternity. All right, so we have to keep it reasonable. Like what's a, what's a, what's a worst case scenario in a reasonable sense? Hey, my biggest client gets hit with a ransomware. They're down for two weeks. I don't have a good relationship with those guys. It's just, it's very transactional. They're going to come after me. All right, let's talk about that. Let's talk about those variables and how much insurance you would reasonably need to cover some type of situation like that. Then, how much insurance do you need to sleep well at night? That's always going to play into this, okay? So I have had uh, one client that I'm thinking of in particular he comes to me, we're going through this exercise and he goes, Hey Joe, you know what? I really appreciate it. I got to have $5 million worth of insurance. And I was like, uh, why? Right. Looking at this, you're working with, you know, SMBs and I, I can't imagine a scenario where that's going to come into play. And he said to sleep at night, I got to have 5 million bucks. He was like, that's the number in my brain. I appreciate all this information. I got to have this much to sleep good at night. Okay, well, that guy ended up with 5 million bucks worth of insurance. Then remember, hey, you got the two sides. Are you concerned that you're going to have a cyber claim and an E&O claim in the same year? Well, okay, that could be an issue, right? Now, generally speaking, I think MSPs are more concerned with E&O claims as opposed to cyber claims internally. But talk about this with your business partners and make sure uh, that you guys are all in agreement with what you're doing here. Now, the last bullet point there, I put that in there to point out, you know, insurance is just part of the equation. All right. Contracts are also a big part of that. Now, hopefully you didn't borrow a contract from a buddy. Hopefully you have your contract reviewed once a year by a qualified attorney. I know that doesn't always happen. All right, so if you're in that camp, hey, just go back, look at that limitation of liability clause. I'll put that video, uh, I'll link to it here in the end, right? Make sure that your contracts are up to date, all right? Make sure you understand the venue of dispute. That's going to play part of it. That's also why you don't want to borrow contracts from friends. Now, here's an example of one of those legal requirements that I mentioned, all right? So this is from, I think it was South Carolina. But in this case, it was, hey, if you're a registered limited liability partnership, you shall carry at least 100,000 of liability insurance. Now, why would a state do this? Some other states, like I think West Virginia has higher limits. Uh, Don't quote me on that. But one, a lot of business owners are surprised, hey, that there's an insurance requirement. But you got to consider, hey, why why would the states do this? They're saying, hey, we're going to protect you. But... Part of that wager is if we're going to protect you as a legal entity, 
well then the other side of that coin is you have to have insurance to make people whole again. You can't just have all of the benefits and none of the responsibilities. All right, so it's kind of the benefit responsibility uh, seesaw there. Then contractual requirements, you'll see this. I did put out a video, it was something like a very uh, boring you know, insurance contract language review or breakdown, something like that. You'll find it um, on my channel. But <clears throat> you'll often see a whole bunch of other stuff within contractual requirements. So very rarely does it just say, hey, carry this much of this type of insurance. Often it has all of these other issues inside of it. Now, arguably that's for uh, someone like myself or broker to look through this, compare it to your policy, make sure that you're doing okay there. There could be additional clauses in there. Uh, primary non-contributory, additional insured, waiver of subrogation, all that stuff. Make sure you watch the video so you have a handle on that. But you'll see very often, I see contractual require, requirements for MSPs where they're asking for cyber liability insurance. Now, once again, very, very rare that an MSP will have a standalone cyber policy. So that should be taken care of on your tech e &O. So often there's just a little bit of back and forth there to make sure that the opposing party actually understands what they're asking for isn't feasible, but you have a functional equivalent. The reason we see this stuff is because attorneys are generally wholly unaware of one, what an MSP is, as I'm sure you've seen, and two, what tech e &O is and is not. All right, so often you'll see this, but here it was 2 million aggregate, we had to get them 2 million bucks worth of insurance. Here, a much more explicit, kinder, um, more knowledgeable contractual requirement. And this was just straight up for tech e &O for $2 million worth of insurance. So you got 2 million contractually, you have to get 2 million. Um, I've gotten the question before, what happens if you're contractually obligated to carry 2 million, but you only have a million? I don't know, but we'll talk a little bit about piercing the corporate veil here moving forward. Now, Man, that was a great segue. Look at that. <clears throat> Piercing the corporate veil. I picked New York as an example. I'm not your attorney. I'm not giving you legal advice here. I'm just going broad brush considerations. But I wanted to bring in New York because generally that's seen as more of a, you know, transactional kind of cutthroat business environment. So business owners are always worried about their personal assets. Hey, what about my house? What about my sports car? What about my boat? these types of things. Well, people form corporations, LLCs, etc., precisely to limit or eliminate their personal liability. That's why the government's on board with this at the federal level. That's why the government's on board with this at the state level, because they're saying, hey, we have to provide some type of protection for these business owners, because if we didn't, nobody would ever start a business. If it was super common that the corporate veil was getting pierced and they were going after personal assets, except in really extenuating circumstances, I'll give you kind of two examples here. People just wouldn't start businesses. So keep in mind, it's not that common. Now, at least here in New York, the general rule, this is from Angelino v. Francis J. Angelino, was principles of corporations and LLCs are not personally liable for entity debts. So once again, they're saying these type of corporate structures exist for a reason. It's to limit liability. LLC, limited liability. Now, of course, there are going to be exceptions. All right, talk to your attorney. But kind of some general exceptions here, prevent fraud. So if you just set up this corporate entity, to do some super shady business. Yeah, corn are going to like that. Um, I don't, hopefully nobody watching this video is in that position. Next, achieving equity while balancing the totality of circumstances. So what could that possibly mean? Uh, let's take Bernie Madoff as an example. All right, the guy committed a bunch of fraud, embezzled a bunch of money, set up a Ponzi scheme, lied to a bunch of people, duped a whole bunch of people. Obviously, the court's going to go, hey, you have a legal entity here. Well, your conduct was so outrageous. It was so egregious. No, we are not going to let you keep 
all the cars and the big houses and the vacation homes um, and the retirement plans and all that stuff. We're not going to let you do that because we do not want to incentivize fraud. All right. So in that case, it totally makes sense. Now, I often get the question, what if you don't have any insurance? Well, that's a hard question to answer. But if you're an organization and you have this this type of protection, uh, I could see a court going, well, you know, you can't have all the benefits without any of the risks. All right. So that's where I could see the equity argument coming into play. So once again, not super common that they're piercing the corporate veil and speak to your own attorney. I am not your attorney. Now let's bring this all together to kind of provide a big picture. Hey, the guy suing you is probably going to know how much insurance you have. All right. Most of these policies are defense within the limit starts eroding how much the plaintiff can get right at the end of the day. So it encourages a settlement, keeps the legal system oiled and operating and moving uh, so we don't just have court cases going on till eternity. Next, insurance companies generally have an obligation to reasonably offer a settlement and settle within your limits. And piercing the corporate veil is, that's a high bar and it's not super common, Okay. So when it comes to overall limits of insurance, all that being said with all this stuff in your brain now, think about the Goldilocks zone, all right? You don't want so much they're going to keep you in court forever that the defense expenses aren't eroding enough and they're just going to take you to town, all right? But you don't want so little that you just don't have defense. So maybe you're like, well, what if I only have 100000 Well. You're not going to be able to defend anything and you're going to have an inadequate defense because the insurance company is going to freak out and they're going to go, oh my God, we can do nothing with this. This is bad for everybody all around, right? And I could see, hey, let's say a crazy example. You're a $10 million MSP. You only have $100,000 worth of insurance. You get sued for $3 million from one of your big corporate clients. I could see the court maybe not taking the most favorable view uh, when it comes to your protections as an entity. And then, of course, you don't want to be a bad business partner. All right. And this is where all of your clients come into play. Right. You got big clients. You probably want more insurance. You want to be a good business partner. You want to be able to make them whole again within reason. All right. Within reason. So don't be a bad business partner. And just remember, your reputation is ultimately on the line here. So. Yes, I understand that the legal system is adversarial in our country, but also at the end of the day, we got to start thinking long term here to make sure that we're not just throwing your reputation out to save a couple bucks. All right, so moving forward, one, I would say for MSPs, consider a million bucks per claim in aggregate as a starting point. That is super common. Um, And then it just kind of goes up from there. Anything below that, I don't even know if you could buy something lower than that. But a million bucks, that's a good starting point for you. Next, assess your own needs and requirements and talk to your business partners about it. Okay? So your requirements, your needs, your sleep good at night factor is going to be different than your buddy or anybody else here um, that watches this online or is in one of your trade groups. It's really just going to be a very personal decision with a million different factors that are hyper specific to your MSP. Next, go back to those contracts, please. If you have a terrible contract, if you have a contract with unenforceable terms in it because you borrowed it from a buddy, you haven't had it reviewed by a qualified attorney, that's really going to bite you in the butt. All right. So please. Make sure you go back. Hey, what's that limitation of liability clause? What are the general rules in your state? And make sure your contracts are updated. Next, just keep in mind, some amount of risk, it's it's unavoidable. We just cannot get rid of all risk. Okay, so yeah, maybe that asteroid could hit the eastern seaboard and wipe out everybody's data and you could just get sued by everybody all at once. All right, well, if that's the case... I don't know what to tell you. I have no idea what would happen. It's never happened in history um, as far as humans have been around. So remember that, right? 
keep it within reason. Keep it within reason. And then, hey, if you're ever in doubt, seek qualified legal counsel. They will give you much more specifics and they will give you qualified legal advice uh, specific to your venue of dispute, etc. Now, with that, if you found it useful, you learned something, you like this, uh, like, share, comment, subscribe, send this to your business partners so you guys can start getting a handle on making sure that everybody's happy with what your insurance limits are. Right above me, I'm going to try and put the limitation of liability clause uh, if the YouTube gods allow me. And if you click over there on my beautiful face, you can subscribe to my channel. All right, guys, with that, stay safe.